The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Well, welcome to Sarah's Country for your midweek. Did you notice it's midweek? Or do all of the days just seem to blend into each other at the moment? Did you actually know it's April? God, I thought it was still March until someone told me it's actually Anzac Day on Saturday. Can we just please fast forward and just start 2021, I think. Uh, this year is done. Now, now, something I really hope is not a write-off is, of course, duck shooting. Had a press release come over the old inbox today sent from one of uh, your local politicians, Jackie Dean. And I love the way that it read. It's kind of like dad to mum after the child's been uh, in the naughty corner, has behaved and should be locked uh, should be allowed out. It says, hunters have respected the restrictions of level four and have stayed home uh, throughout the biggest hunting period of the year in the roar. Like good children. No, it didn't say that. They're understandably itching to get back out there. And it's not fear. No, I added that little bit on too. But it is, of course, opening weekend, meant to be next weekend for uh, duck shooting. And hunters have been keeping themselves, of course, entertained with the Great New Zealand Mouse Hunt on Facebook, filming their trapping endeavours inside. But I think it's time to uh, let them go isolate from this isolation in the bush. It got me thinking about the different types of hunters I was explaining over dinner tonight to Joel. Aren't they certainly uh, not all cut from the same cloth? If you think about you've got your ultimate pig hunter with his 15 dogs, four-wheelers and a crated DB, versus your mountain goat thighs of the tar hunter with his pickaxe and protein shakes. The deer hunter, though, with his 90s Hilux putties and hip flask of Appletons. And then you have the tartan cheese cutter, drinking 21-year-old single malt Glenmorangie on the tailgate of his Land Rover. Am I right? I'm right, yes. My fingers are crossed, though, for you all, those itchy hunters, that you can get back out there really, really soon. I'd love to know in the comments below, uh, what type of hunter are you from the ones that I just described before? Do you like a bit of fresh sign out there on the hill or just a wee tipple uh, on the Mai Mai? Let me know. I want to know and I'll read out your comments below. Also, if you were meant to be going out hunting, not saying it's not off yet, but what duck pond, whereabouts, what hunting block, I want to know across the country. Right, so coming up in the show, with the uncertainty in the forecasted milk price next season, but looking closer to a break-even point for our New Zealand dairy farmers, it's important to not burn through cash right at the moment. So Ag First economist Phil Jeannot joins us to discuss budgeting on this, in this uncertain time after 7.20. After 7.30, we are joined on Cirrus Country by a straight-shooting, cowboy-wearing favourite human of mine, whose message tonight is keep calm and farm on. And don't use all your energy on what you can't control. Of course, that is the wonderful head of analytics for NZX, Julia Jones, who continues uh, the conversation around milk price, but we'll dive into her thoughts on the future milk price option from Fonterra. And at the end of the show, we have in my mind one of rural New Zealand's power couples, Matt and Yana Hocken, farming in the Manawatu. With a diverse history overseas, they bring back to their home country wisdom on farming smarter, not harder, and it's worth a listen. But first up on Serious Country, we're going to dive into the liquid gold that is our UMF Manuka honey industry with John Rawcliffe and the boom that has taken off with global consumers wanting, of course, products that support their immunity. So here's a snippet from a video that's gone viral on YouTube about why Manuka honey is so insanely expensive. This is Sarah's Country. This isn't just any old honey, it's Manuka honey. And in its purest form, it can cost up to $99 per 100 grams. That's more than 100 times the price of normal honey. So why is it so expensive? Manuka honey is known for being earthier, richer, and more viscous than many other honeys. It comes from the nectar of the flower Leptospermum scoparium, also known as Manuka, which is only native to New Zealand. And Manuka, in fact, is a Maori word. 
fact that it comes from New Zealand, that gives it a premium just to start with. And because the bee travels up to about six kilometres to collect this honey. And so this honey is representative of the environment, and that environment is of New Zealand, Aotearoa. The plant itself and the honey is very, very rare. Out of all the honeys in the world, it probably represents 1% of all the world honeys. It's difficult to harvest. It's only a two to six week harvesting period and the flower is only open for, any, for 12 days. And in New Zealand we have wind and we have rain and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of luck involved in getting the bee or a lot of effort from the beekeeper. And for some years there are no, uh, there is no honey production for some beekeepers. And we have to go to the big extent also of using helicopters to collect this honey. Although manuka bushes can also be found in Australia, New Zealand accounts for almost all of the world's production, with exports worth $204 million and expected to quadruple to $800 million by 2028. New Zealand's honey is protected by a quality standard that safeguards Manuka's special properties. This honey is an expensive honey, and anything that is expensive, people will try and copy people will try and mimic or people will try and cheat. So a lot of the cost here isn't actually in the protection of it, all the research so we know it's unique, we know it's from New Zealand. We can identify it. We've put labs around the world to be able to do this identification. The New Zealand government has set up a standard to say what is Manukahani. So. How tantalizing was that beautiful, gorgeous honey there explaining to us why, of course, uh, Manuka honey has positioned itself very, very, very well. Uh, but, of course, it's, it is insanely expensive. Before we go to our next guest, uh, I am asking you about your comments uh, about those itching to go hunting. Is there anyone watching out there that is set to go duck shooting next weekend? Whereabouts? Uh, tag your mates who you were meant to go with, or not saying it's not off yet. Uh, or those those particular hunting blocks that you love going. What are the best parts of New Zealand to go hunting? I want to know uh, throughout the show. Tony Thompson, uh, interview new conservative. Please explain yourself, sir. I'm not quite sure what you mean there. Kieran, Kieran says that Richard Clo uh, got any manuka over there. I'm not quite sure what you're talking about there either, Kieran. But get the fingers working. Uh, we want to drum up some uh, questions for our guests. If you missed it, uh, who's coming up in the show? Uh, have a look across, of course, on, on the Facebook post above. Now, a surge in consumer demand for honey, in particular manuka honey, has brought a welcome boost to prospects for one of the country's largest producers, coming on the heels of a good harvest season. The strong demand experienced in mid-March by Convita for its propolis and manuka honey products resulted in an online sales growth of 70% during the first 10 days of March. This had done much to offset the losses experienced in retail sales and, of course, the major drop in tourists purchasing it here in New Zealand and uh, leaving with suitcases full. John Rawcliffe, spokesman for the unique, unique Manuka Factor Honey Association, and joins us now. John, has COVID been the, the big game changer for Manuka Honey? Is it just really taking it to another level from where uh, we were prior COVID? Um, the demand has always been there for the Manuka Honey industry. And uh, for those selling genuine Manuka honey, they had no problem in selling this honey. But the, uh, this obviously what has happened is uh, accelerated that demand and intensified it. So that's probably the way I see why the demand has gone up. People have always known its values, always known its position. This has intensified it. So what about the manufacturing protocols of COVID? Has that affected supply chains? Uh, it has. Um, the industry has worked very, very well with the ministry to ensure uh, under level four that as an essential service, they could carry on doing business. Uh, the big problem was, you know, how to, how to get it to market and how to get, how to make it happen in that, in that space. The price and the problems of getting it exported has gone up considerably. Uh, but those going B2B, business to business, are doing well. Uh, they've been able to get it uh, to the door of the distributor. Uh, the distributor knows who they are directly. They've been able to do that or end up the price and the problems of doing it has actually in increased. So, yeah, they've been able to get it out there to market and work through the issues.
Of course, in terms of the consumer demand, as we were speaking uh, there and, of course, earlier, Ian Proudfoot was on Serious Country the other day, uh, John, and he was explaining, of course, consumers' demand to help build immunity in this fear of uh, keeping well through something like a pandemic. Is that really underpinning the demand as well? From the consumer perspective, yes, they're saying... As I said previously, they recognise the value of this honey. Uh, there is this this pandemic, and they're saying, "Well, um, as part of my program, I will take this honey," uh, and that's the way it's linked. Um, there are, you know, it's been a great demand. There is the demand. We've had a good season. There is demand. We've been able to get it to market, but we need to look ahead from that. We need to look ahead four, three, four months. The discretionary spend overseas is going to get very questionable. You know, when, when you've got a choice of like-minded products and you're under, under price pressure, you turn around and choose something that is slightly a less price, assuming it's going to be the same thing. So the industry is actually needs to think three, four months ahead at this point and go, okay, what are we doing to truly differentiate, to make sure the consumer's got obvious, clear choices over this is Manuka honey. It has its qualities, a rating system that's meaningful to why I purchase it. So the industry is thinking three or four months ahead at the moment to say how it does that, like protecting the term Manuka honey, like ensuring its rating system is meaningful um, and ensuring its values and proposition is clean and clear to the consumer. I can certainly see the boxing gloves coming off, and it already did. It was a year or so ago when uh, MPI was obviously able to pump at least uh, $6 million into our fight against, of course, our Aussie cousins to predict the brand of Manuka. How is that playing out in terms of uh, trade protectionism around the UMF? Um, well, that's playing out reasonably well. I mean, the industry, bluntly, for it to receive that money, had to get its act together. It's got its act together. Um, there has been uh, a Manuka Charitable tr- Trust set up. Um, the chair of that is uh, Pitta Tippany, and they uh, are there to be the, uh, the holder of the intellectual property if we're successful in markets for this. So putting all that together, there's an operating company under a gentleman called Victor Goldsmith to be able to see the program through. So um, we've put these internal structures in place to ensure that we're able to protect this term, uh, utilise the government's money, But as I said before, it's very critical we get on and do that ASAP because the consumer is going to look at alternative products and the consumer will make a choice to say, ah, this is something of a a lesser price, but it's got that word or a rating system that's confusing. We have to differentiate. We have to meet the consumer's expectations. Doing this program to protect the term in Ogani has become super critical. How do you get on when you've lost so many of your amazing honey ambassadors, the, uh, the, the Asian tourists through Queenstown and back out the other end with a suitcase full of it? We don't have that, uh, that, that trade that really underpins the understanding of what makes New Zealand UMF Manuka honey so special. Um, the, the demand overseas is there. They, um, there's always ways to get things to market. Um, there's always, um, and that I think the industry is quite sharp and is able to say, okay, how do we get it to market? They've been able to work that through. So not there's never been just one single channel. So uh, getting it to market, the industry is very good at that. Uh, again, the ministry has been supportive and helpful. Uh, there's been programs about how to get them at a co-pack onto a plane to get many consignments onto a plane to one area. So yeah, they've been able to work that through. So the demand's there. Uh, they've been able to work out to get to market. What are you looking forward to in the next phase of of this uh, chapter for Manuka Honey and being able to, you know, put into work or see the success of some of the work that you've put into place around this protectionism? Uh, well, the the first work started when the UMF Honey Association started to do what we called the Manuka ID project, where we went around the country and we literally acted like a bee and collected nectar. At that day, we knew what Manuka was. We used the great science of, of people like Dr. Terry Braggins who analysed this honey and said, you've got 2,300 unique markers. You've got these dominant ones. We know what Manuka is. And once you know what it is, you can know what it does. And once you know what it is, you can protect it. So on that journey to really understand what it does and to protect it and provide that in a package and on a label that says to consumer, we know what it does, we know what it is, we can protect it. Here it is here. So that's our next journey. So it's been that sort of way. And, you know, we know what it is. 
we know what it can now we can really discover what it does and we can protect it key to the program now i'm just interested on a personal level john because i like to obviously know the people behind the industry uh what got you into a role like this yourself that's a very good question it's, it, you, you sort of fall into these roles um I've always had a, I used to work for a company where we did a lot of nutraceuticals, unique products that we could protect, add value to and develop. Um, so I've always been sort of involved in that. So, um, and then came along this honey industry and it sort of fit the sort of the, uh, the, the economic belief systems, the economics, my understandings. And Manuka is one of those key um, products from New Zealand. So I fell into it. It's been an interesting journey to say the least. Uh, the industry is brilliant at times to work with um, and um, yeah, it's simple as that. And you're based whereabouts? Um, I'm sitting here in St. Helier's, um, <laughs> which is which is great. Um, you know, um, it's a good, and, good part of the country. He's a good friend of mine might live around the road from you, Mr. Um, Hamish Mackay. Do you, have, you, have you bumped into him? He's a rather large chap that drinks coffee at La Vista around about 7.30 in the morning. I get back from the gym and, um, and I, and I sort of waved him and there's a group that always sort of gathers at about 7.30 in La Vista and he's definitely one of them. He puts his lycra on, pretends he's been cycling and he's sitting with the cyclists at La Vista <laughs> drinking I, I, coffee. I, what? I don't look at that. <laughs> I, I that, that that's a no-go area. Thank you. Oh, I miss Auckland so much, John. Hey, that's John Ray Raycliffe. Thank you so much for joining us from the UMF Honey Association talking about the, uh, of course, a boom that's happening in, in the midst of COVID outbreak with the values there um, because consumers, of course, are focusing very heavily on the immunity at the moment. If you've just joined us, if you're new, I can see actually some new comments coming in. Um, Sarah's Country is, of course, all on demand straight away first thing uh, tomorrow morning on podcast. So look, look up Sarah's Country on podcast, subscribe to us, as well as you can watch all of the interviews as well. Go to farmersweekly.co.nz forward slash Sarah's country and of course the ticker along the bottom is just a slice of the daily digest that Farmers Weekly offer now uh, daily news in your inbox subscribe there as well now next up on Sarah's country we discuss how dairy farmers can keep their head above the milk to be the 11 billion dollar golden child our economy is counting on with ag first Phil Jeannot. But first, here's a great little story that is sent in to us from Dairy Women's Network uh, about Emily and Dylan from Taupo. This is Sarah's Country. this land, not just for us, but for generations to come. It's really important that we have the best land, that we build this environment to be environmentally friendly, sustainable, and here for, for our children and for their children's children. Here's your lunchbox. Hey. Hey. involved in the farm they actually need to have a centre out here. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. So you can put the kids here, go down do the calves, do your home stuff, <laughs> do the books and then you can come back and pick your kids up. It's quite it works really well. Alright. I'm out there milking. I'm out there shifting the cows. If Dylan needs me to do anything I'm happy to get stuck in there. Here you go, girls. It's really important for our animals to have the best possible life. We want it to be beautiful, lush grass that they're having. This is Trixie. She's our pet cow. They're all our pets, actually. I'll give them some milk. We want our pigs to have good milk. There you go. Get in there. Oh, gosh. Because they drink the milk from the cows as well. Um, we drink the milk ourselves. Oh yeah! So it's really important for us to really love that product. Essentially, happy cows make better milk. 
there's also the business side. I'm forecasting for different months ahead. I'm doing accounts, paying bills, paying wages, making sure that we've got like good stuff, management practices as well. It's the best job you can have. We have used Fonterra a couple of times to do some recruiting. Our latest worker, David, is actually one who came to work with us two years ago that we've just got to come back. Um, he's actually our daughter's godfather. He is really special to us. I really love being creative. I love having beautiful interiors and I wanted to bring something of that into our space and our land, so we developed um, the telephone exchange, our glamping accommodation. We stayed at home for quite a while to work out what we were going to do with it. People call me a hoarder sometimes, but I think it's just an antiques collector. Always collecting things like old gates and old bit of timber and bits of iron and taps and stuff like that, so I always knew that I had a an end project in mind and yeah I guess what we see here is, is the end project. You're coming off the grid here so people get to have that simple way of life. You don't need the hustle and bustle of big bright lights or a, a city hotel, you know, you can get it all here and it's perfect. With us being able to have this on the farm, I guess it allows us not to have to go bigger in numbers with cows. It makes that whole sustainability thing a lot better. If you asked me back at university what I was going to do, I'd be saying, oh, I'd be living in the city. I would have never envisioned myself for a second to be in Tirahonga. But it's the best decision. We get to wake up every day to this beautiful piece of paradise. And it's so lucky because we've got the dairy industry right there. We're doing it, we're milking our cows, we're looking after the nation. I could never go back. You can never take the country out of the girl. I feel like that now. I feel like I'm the country girl. Right, well, milk prices next season are predicted at uh, six plus dollars, of course, kilos of milk solids and are going to drop many dairy farmers into that break even territory. For a farmer to make debt repayments and some capital expenditure on environmental matters, we need to be closer to $7. So it is with pleasure I welcome to Serious Country tonight Ag First economist Phil Jeannot. Good evening, sir. Hi Sarah, how are you? Good, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Now Phil, we have been here many times before around those certain prices, but how do we navigate this when we simply don't know how long the effects of COVID will be? Well, I think, I think the main thing really, Sarah, is, is to well start planning ahead, if you like. Um, I mean, what I'd suggest to, to farmers now is Sort out, do a budget for this year or update your budget for this year so you know where you're standing. If you're looking at a surplus, then look what you can carry across into next year. Um, mechanisms such as the Income Equalisation Act, or schemes rather, uh, are, are there. You know, most of the country's in drought, so that those provisions are a little bit easier. But I'd also suggest um, you probably really need to start doing a budget for next year and in that respect, I'd suggest do a budget at 650, see where you stand, then plug in a six dollar payout, and just see what you need to do to, um, to you know, to meet that the drop in income, and then do another budget at or plug in another price at 550, and just see what you need to do, which is really getting down to sort of survival type uh, mode. Yeah, sure. And what are some of those things you've seen in the past uh, when we have had those real low payouts? where people have probably, can I say, culled the wrong thing or uh, been too short-term in their, in their thinking to come out the other side? Yeah, well, I, I guess the main things that, that tend to be put off are, are certainly discretionary-type spending, um, you know, capital replacement, uh, farm development, uh, that sort of thing. 
Um, if we're looking at a sub six dollar um, payout, then most farmers won't be able to make uh, capital debt repayments, and they'll, they'll yeah they basically won't be able to make capital expenditure, particularly around environmental type uh, projects. What advice uh, in dealing directly with the banks around support around these cash flow tightening times? Do you recommend, Phil? Yeah, yeah, well, yes, I think, again, given the drop in, in, in payout, um, a lot of farmers will be pushed to make capital repayments, which the, the banks have been getting very keen on in the last couple of years. I mean, if we head into a sub-$6 payout, then I think uh, farmers will really need to, to um, talk with their bank about coming back to interest only. And Phil, of course, we and, talk. Yeah. Yeah. And just sorry, just jumping there too around uh, there's not any money in the kitty for environmental matters, let alone capital repayments. How do you feel? What's your suggestion for the unknown around environmental reform and the cost of that coming at a sector that clearly is on mainstream TV saying, we need you and your $11 billion? <laughs> Sorry, it's a quite well, guess, politically I mean, decisive question, but um, to be able to make those decisions. Well, I guess, I mean, there's huge uncertainty, at, you know, heading out in, into next year. Um, all I can suggest is, is, in terms of some of those compliance costs, um, you really need to hold your farm expenditure as tight as you possibly can um, to hopefully allow, you know, there's some surplus there to, to cover those sort of costs. We're speaking later in the show to Matt and Yana Hocken, I know you'll know well from the Manawatu, Phil. What are uh, some of the key attitudes and as well as uh, you know business fitness that you've seen in some of your top clients, dairy farming clients, that you can give advice on how they navigate tough times? Well, I think, I think one of the, probably two key things, if you, if you like. One is they certainly financially budget and they update that regularly, so they know where they where they stand, where they're heading, if you like, and and um, are able to juggle that money around uh, as things progresses. The other key thing is they do a lot of feed budgeting as well, so they've got a very good handle on how they're going to feed the cows, the sort of production they can expect, um, that sort of thing, and, and both flow um, together. And it's important. I mean, little savings in every direction soon add up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. It's Phil Geno from Ag First with some fantastic advice there in terms of navigating a low payout in a drought amidst COVID and a lot of uncertainty. Now, coming up after the break, we share some honest tips, of course, from NZX Head of Analytics on hedging your future with Julia Jones. This is Sarah's Country. Dear New Zealand. We know things are really tough out there right now. People are concerned about their health and the health of their loved ones. People are worried about the economy and when will things get back to normal. Believe me when I say us farmers are feeling it too, but now's no time to panic. Our country can get through this together. We just need to follow instructions and stay home. Inside our bubble. Let's flatten this curve and stop this disease spreading. You don't need to worry about supermarkets getting low on food. There's plenty to go around for everyone! All the countries that could run out of food, New Zealand is not one of them. Our farmers are world leading. And we're damn good at what we do, producing high quality food. We have strong supply lines. And we're all working hard to keep food on the table. For your family and for ours. New Zealand dairy farmers produce enough for 100 million people. You're in good hands, New Zealand. You can count on us to keep calm and carry on farming. We're trusting you to stay at home to keep our country safe. We are following the rules too. We can do this. We're all in this together. Cheers, New Zealand. Delicious. Ever wondered where it starts? Does it start with care? 
respect. Fresh grass, 365 days a year. The truth is, delicious doesn't start in a single moment or with a single ingredient. Delicious starts here. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or oh, horse thief. Or bee suits. Shield bench. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But in farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow. Milk. Dredge. Rear. Come on in. Because we're out here too. Right, now we're talking to a friend earlier today and uh, I'm, I don't know if I should say fortunate or unfortunate that I don't have young children at home. I've got Joel, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Joel, I mean that in the beautifulest possible way. Uh -huh. But no, there was a saying about, you know, it's, it's sort of dealing with the, um, the practising of the musical instruments uh, that's starting to wear really thin. And it uh, got me thinking, and I was talking with Joel again over dinner tonight, and it's sort of, uh, you know, there, there's not just one instrument that's really annoying. Of course, we, we know the go-to, you know, the recorder. But you sit and listen to someone who can't play the drums properly, or the bat. Or a, or a violin. You reckon the violin, Joel? Oh, it's absolutely the worst instrument if you can't play it right, yeah. Yeah, but what about the bagpipes? Oh, in a small room? Yeah, no, not a chance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I just want to say, you know, my thoughts are there for all of those uh, at home that are going through this suffering at the moment. I'd love to know in the comments below, what is the most annoying instrument to listen to to someone who can't play it? I'd really, really love to know. Now, a bit like musical instruments, when they're good, they're great. And when they're ratchet, they're horrid, kind of like our milk prices. How was that for a segue, Julia? That's a nice segue. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Thank I you. actually grew up with a brother that's a drummer, so I can actually relate. He's a very good drummer, but it's still painful. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad he was good, but he started off somewhere, didn't he? Like yeah, what, he with the rollers on the dinner table? On the oh, on sorry. the Tupperware containers in the pots. Ah, that must have driven your mother mad. All of us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now first up, we're explaining the relatively new, uh, as I learned today, it's only been around, what, a year, the future milk price options took over from, what was it, the guaranteed milk price from Fintera. Uh, yeah. Now tell us, what happened first when they first came out, farmers' attitudes to it, and this latest oversubscription, uh, sort of standing in the in the doll queue with the handout? Um, well. I mean, when they first came out, they you, it was split. Like, it's really hard to generalise because I think there was a number of people that, that really seen the value of them and been able to fix in their margin. And then there were a number of people who felt that they were unfair. And so they actually got voted out. Um, and, and so then, uh, you know, the, the volatility and things in the market continued. It didn't go away. And then people asked for Fonterra to step up and support them with, hedging some of their prices and this this came about with their um, get well with their milk fixed milk price at the moment but I mean the open futures market's been around since 2010 mm -hmm. so but basically talking about uh, six dollars 32 a kilo in April massively over oversubscribed but I understand it's still a very small percentage of people that can sign up to this sort of supply contract. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously you need to be supplying Fonterra to start with and there's a couple of other companies that have come in with it as well. Um, but, look, it's people are are wanting to lock in their margin. Um, I'd hope it's not people thinking that they're outsmarting the market because the best thing you can do when you think about futures or, or fixing your milk price is really think about what's right for your business and look at, you know, how do you lock in a margin, what's your break even and all those sorts of things. Dairy farmers think that way. Are they that way inclined? You know, I know obviously in the wool industry at the start with supply contracts, they went, oh, why would I do that? Now they're the God's gift to merino wool. But, um, of course, you know, the red meat sector didn't really fly. So what's the attitudes towards well, it? 
I think the attitudes are good. I mean, naturally, you know, farmers are traders. You know, that's <laughs> you have to be able to move really fast and make quick decisions. And, and, and by nature, um, I think some have that really uh, inherent trader type mentality. So if I fix, what if it gets better? And will I miss an opportunity? And so I think the attitudes, I mean, look, we've had kind of seasons where it's ended better than um, it began. You know, the seasons are higher than where they started. So there's always a reluctance in that situation to want to fix. But um, I think we're growing. We're working it out. We're working out that it's risk management, that it's not trading, and it's not trying to outsmart the market. You'll never outsmart the market. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, hedge your bets both ways makes a lot of sense. We seem to try to get that mentality when it comes to our mortgages. Um, and so, therefore, but it, I mean, the thing is, too, there's a lot of panic out there um, on things. And you say, you know, don't try and control what you can't control. It's the first thing of uh, reducing anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, at the moment there are lots of payouts out there. So there's the range is 560 to 709. So, you know, I think I said it the other day is you, all that tells us is nobody has a clue. And there's so many variables and there's going to be heaps of headwinds. And I kind of think it's probably going to take the scenic route to something that's digestible. So we, you know, we may need to pop a seatbelt on and strap in for the ride. But there, so there will be some scary moments where that payout forecast drops significantly. But that's only going to be because there's a whole lot of things trying to find a a new new normal or a new grounding session. And I think, you know, we're going to have headwinds, we're going to have changes in demand. And I just think that we need to just focus on what we can control, which is in our business. And that's, you know, if you're that worried about the milk price, then fix it. Mm, absolutely. I, I'm just going to swing into something else that I know you're passionate and heavily involved with. You sitting on on the board uh, with uh, our guest from last night, Wayne Langford's Meet the Need charity. Why did you jump on board with that? Look, it was actually quite personal. We um, used food banks a lot when I was a kid. And um, I actually understand, you know, how hard that was for my parents or for my mum to actually, the pride thing, and and it's not easy for people to use them. Um, And so I just felt that it was an incredible cause. I love what we produce in New Zealand. I'm so incredibly proud of the produce that we, we bring together. And I think everyone has a right to have nutrition, regardless of our um financial situation and you know there's so many studies that show good nutrition actually support people making better decisions that support um thinking that actually you know there's even a study that shows it reduced crime um because when people have you know better health from their body they have better health in their brain and so i don't know i just and wayne and siobhan are just two people that i have always had a lot of time for and, and really respect and the energy and the work they've put onto into this is massive you know this is this isn't a quick um idea they had and they busted it out like they took the time to really think through what they needed to do and, and they've put some blood sweat and absolute tears into it I feel very grateful that I get to just ride in after the hard work's done really <laughs> yeah absolutely we know how you love to, to ride of course Julia hey but uh-huh. on that um you are uh, such an at the forefront advocate for uh the future of our food and farming here in New Zealand and positioning ourselves as a value-added uh focused um vision in New Zealand Tell me the importance though, then, though, of why we need to look after our own in this process. I think it needs to build part of our story. So our story offshore is health. So what we actually produce in New Zealand is very is, is health food. We're actually connecting consumers offshore with health. And we can't, you know, New Zealand's actually like number two for obesity. Uh, you know, we have 183,000 kids, which will be ex- exponentially higher now living in poverty. And um, we can't actually sell food and, and co- you know, have a great story about health and well-being for other countries when we're not doing it for our own and that's got to be part of our future story that it doesn't mean that we need to have them it's not binary you know or mutually exclusive we can actually have those two beautiful things intersecting where we feed and have nutritional equality in our country and that builds a really important part of the story 
um, when we're selling into other countries. Do you think we're very short-sighted in that we don't actually understand the intertwinedness of every action that we do and how it can actually make us a profitable prosperity, um, have prosperity as well? Yeah, I think sometimes we, I think by nature New Zealand is quite, um, can can have a shorter term focus. So we, I don't know, maybe we've all got too much millennial blood, but we, you know, we like that um, instant gratification or we'll look for something in a very short space. And I think holistically for everyone, and this is not singling out any particular industry or I think it's a, it's a country culture, I think we actually just need to start thinking about um, that we can actually have well-being, we can actually have profitability. Like these things aren't, aren't separate. And I think we get into this habit of thinking if we've got a good environment, if we've got well-being in our people, then we can't possibly have profitability. And there's not a pay, there's not a um, compromise there. We can actually have it all. We just have to think really long term. And there's a few things we're going to have to let go of um, and there'll be some new things we'll need to engage with. Yep, we're on the same page, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, just ahead of our, our next guests, the, this book, you would have seen it here. The Lean Dairy Farm. You've heard of Matt and Yana Hocken. What do you think? Good humans? Uh, incredible humans. Um, the book is fantastic. I would highly recommend the book regardless of your industry because it's about principles. And um, I've had the pleasure of hearing them both speak multiple times. And um, I think, you know, the wider industry um, right through the supply chain should actually look to engage these guys um, or have conversations with them because they're – their experience and what they've done. Yeah, I'm a huge fan and I just, and they're practical. You know, it's it's not um, it's not this kind of, you know, theoretical stuff that sometimes people struggle to get their head around. They're actually real farmers that really live this and it's 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 the real deal. And I, I would highly recommend that book because it's actually a good, easy read and gives you some really good ideas. Thank you so so much, Julia Jones. It's been too long before I inv- uh, had you on Sarah's Country and we will not leave it this long between drinks again, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> to, now to close the show, of course, we are heading to the Manawatu, to the Hocken household with the book author, innovation leaders, Nuffield Scholar, and just being mum and dad tonight after a day on the dairy farm. We're going to learn how they achieve so much by working smarter, not harder. This is Sarah's Country. Every morning, Kiwi farmers wake up to produce higher quality food. Yet, every night, some Kiwi families are going to sleep hungry. Meet the Need is a charity founded by farmers, and it's here to change all that. We're about New Zealand farmers feeding New Zealand families by donating a small part of what we grow when we can. You can help us make sure no one in New Zealand goes to sleep hungry again. Visit meettheneed.org and follow us on social. Even when everything changes, some things will always stay the same. The cows still need milking, The economy still needs dairy. And dairy farmers will always have what it takes. Whatever you need to keep milking, our job during the lockdown is to get it to you. Because we know what it takes. Aotearoa New Zealand has always been a land that has provided for its people. A land of abundance and opportunity. Our dedicated team at Ag Research know that embracing kaitiakitanga will see this continue for future generations. The work we do is transforming the way we farm and revolutionising the way New Zealanders care for our animals and for our land. We work hard to create the world's most desirable food and bio-based products through smart, sustainable farming, led by some of the world's most phenomenal research 
and informed by the consumers who benefit from this passion. Through a focus on environmental sustainability and climate change initiatives, this passion will allow our work to continue for generations to come. Our proficiencies in research run wide, from seeds to pest control, high-value food production to practical farming systems and quality assurance. From the smallest rural land use project to international research programs, our science and technology innovations drive the prosperity of our precious agricultural sector. It's through this research that New Zealand retains its position as a scientifically advanced global agricultural leader. Our commitment to the growth of our wider New Zealand economy, its people and the kaitiakitanga of Aotearoa is at the very heart of every scientific innovation and creation we deliver. Ag research firmly grounded in this land. These waters, looking to what's in the stars and the future. Ata matai, matai fitu. Now, Dean Williamson, the owner of Global HQ, Farmers Weekly, just checking to see whether he's watching. But no, he said to me the other day, this lockdown feels like one massively long sort of startup hackathon type weekend where innovation's just booming from this lockdown. You know, I've had mates ring me and say, Sarah, right, I've got this idea. I think I've been in lockdown too long. I need you to tell me if I'm not going crazy. And they tell me the idea and it's absolutely brilliant. So in the words of our next guest, you need to collide ideas. You can't just sit by yourself and think you've got a great idea. Sit there for the rest of your days thinking it's a great idea. You actually need to collide that idea with somebody else's. By doing that, we can actually start creating some innovation. So it's about getting the right collaborative networks together. And together we can actually take things forward. Now, of course, we're sitting and broadcasting out of Blink Innovation here on the Lincoln University campus. And I can tell you from first-hand experience, Sierra's Country would not be here right now if I didn't have the collaborative thinking and instead of doing this in isolation at home by myself. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome to the show Matt and Jana Hocken. Firstly, of course, Matt, those were your words uh, as chair of the Rural Innovation Lab. Welcome firstly to Sarah's Country. You've got the young ones off to bed. Well done. <laughs> yep, they're, they're sound asleep. Well, we can't hear them anyway. G'day, Sarah. <laughs> nice, nice to be on the show. Hey, and Matt, tell us firstly about Rural Innovation Lab. Whereabouts did the whole concept start? So the Rural Innovation Lab, it's um, the, the purpose or the reason for our being is really to, to be the trusted place to where ground, groundbreaking ideas are identified, um, developed and delivered alongside innovative farmers and growers. And that's really been the driving force. It's sort of based on, on two pillars, really. One is getting farmers and growers um, to, to lead and, and drive um, the process. They are the founding group. We've got um, farmers and growers from across sectors, dairy, sheep and beef, horticulture, cropping um, in the group. And they, they, they were the founders that brought it together. And then it's about putting it together, um, as you alluded to, with a collaborative um, network to, of innovators. Um, and so that's been, over the past year, that's been uh, Massey University, the factory, Microsoft, um, Maori agribusiness business in the region, um, and a whole host of others have really gotten behind it. Um, it's, it's really been the, um, the idea driving it has been a um, great opportunity for agri-tech, for innovation in New Zealand, and that's certainly growing some really good initiatives going on, down, including down, um, down in Christchurch and Blink. One of the things we really wanted to bring to the table was an organised uh, way for farmers and growers to really um, have, it, have a seat at that table, um, make sure it's really clear what we're demanding in terms of those, those problems or those challenges that we want people to work on. And then also uh, to be able to facilitate it so that um, the innovations that come out the other end really work for farmers. So that's, that's, that's really been the key drivers to it. That's the absolute total nail on the head key major thing is that, you know, we talk about rural proofing policy, but we need to rural proof this technology that we're developing. It's all well and good um, having a lot of amazing tech startups, but if they don't functionally work, farmers aren't going to use them. Yeah, that's right. There's, a, there's some great ideas uh, out there. They need to be tested. And, you know, one of the, one of the things I did a... Um, 
a study on on um, some of the, the real hotspots of innovation around the world and, and where you get the user uh, really closely working um, with the innovator, the technologist, the startup or, or, or the corporate, that's when you get the best um, use and also you reduce the wastage. We don't want to get to the long. Oh, we have lost. Yeah. I'm not too oh. sure what happened there. Oh, oh they're back. We're back. <laughs> Just like that. So we're still here. Yeah, that's right. So, so you were just talking about reducing the wastage, absolutely. Um, now, Yana, I, you have the most incredible background as well as, you, of course, you do too, Matt. Um, could you please firstly explain, before we get into the lean dairy farmer, your background in management systems uh, in other industries and how you've been able to come together to this point of obviously meeting Matt and being at the dairy farm and applying those? Yeah, so my background is in mechanical and industrial engineering. And so I started my career um, working in the automotive industry for the car company Toyota. I started in Australia and then I um, relocated with them to their Belgium um, headquarters, European headquarters. And so I spent my first few years in very much practical engineering, but learning about the Toyota production system, which is all about creating efficiency, eliminating waste out of processes and really optimizing, optimizing your processes so that you're reducing costs, improving quality um, on all these great things. And about 10 years ago, I moved into um, consulting. So I started working for consulting um, companies. Um, specializing in lean, lean consulting. And I started applying these techniques from, from the manufacturing industry to every single sector. So I've, I've worked pretty much in all industry sectors from banking to mining to defense, uh, to rail, to construction, um, yeah, basically, basically healthcare, a lot of work in healthcare. Um, and what I guess I really discovered over those um, 10 years is that the, the principles can apply to almost every industry. And I met Matthew in, in Belgium when I was working over there. And then we lived in Sydney for a few years. And when Matt thought um, it's time to co come back to the family dairy farm, I had no background of farming at all. It was completely foreign to me. Um, but when we did relocate back to New Zealand um, and, and start and, and work on the farm, we, I basically just in the first sort of couple of years of getting my head around farming, I just started seeing all very similar problems that you see in all other industries. Um, because at the end of the day, farming is, whether it's dairy farming or sheep and beef, you've got people, you've got machines and facilities. Okay, animals are a little bit different, but think about healthcare, it's got people in it, you know, vets have got animals too. So there's, there's components, there's processes, machines, materials, people. Um, so there's lots of components that are similar and, and, and farmers have a lot of similar problems, different environment, but similar problems. So I realized, wow, all this stuff, this lean management stuff that I've been applying to all these other industries is just as relevant to farming and farming really needs it. It's actually very in line with the opening title that we play here every night on Sarah's Country. You know, we can't use the same um, problems that we create use to create, same thinking um, yeah. that created the problems exactly. in the first place. Um, Matt, in your similarities uh, across what you're doing with the Rural Innovation Lab, is it really coming down, though, more to our actual attitude in this industry in our in our communities and our mindset that has created us to not be able to see the the systems and processes and the ability to innovate and pivot like you can i think i think everyone's very well capable of it in terms of you know being a, a lean farm or or engaging you know with the real innovation and what what we find is you get um get the right people around you elevate the the thinking and the discussion and you open open minds and once once you can see um you know particularly like yana will put some processes and once once farmers see it's actually very simple um and you know the, the things that we're doing with the rural innovation lab they're actually very simple but it's about getting you know the right people around um elevating the thinking and, and opening the ideas um to it and and re really putting them through <laughs> through a good process so it's it's simple but effective for them Okay, Yana, we were talking earlier, of course, to Phil Jeannot, and then if, just before that, um, Julia Jones, I know you're both a fan of. Some of the key tips 
at the moment. You've, you're both dairy farming as well, so there is no excuse to put these principles in place in a low payout. Yeah, so it's it's um this is this topic is actually just um, perfect for us. We've actually spent the last week doing our own budgeting, and I guess um, lean will really help a lot of farmers because what we're focusing on. Um, we have to focus on the stuff that we can control. So, and farmers, I think, are reasonably pretty resilient because there's challenges every single year. There's new challenges all the time, and there's lots of uncertainty in farming every year, um, whether it's droughts or milk prices or demand. Um, but what we need to do is create businesses that are resilient, that can cope with the ups and downs, and still maintain a profit, whether it's at a five dollar fifty payout or you know at a seven dollar payout. And so the two kind of key things that we're focusing on when we're doing our scenarios is one, optimizing the utilization and efficiency of our existing resources. So that's our people, our facilities, our animals. How can we optimize them? to you know to the maximum capacity and the second one is simplification now when i say though optimize that does not mean overburden it doesn't mean overburdening your people your animals your equipment because that's just going to create waste what it means is creating very efficient processes eliminating waste unnecessary non-value added stuff that we're doing so that we can optimize um, our, our utilization of these resources that we have. And, and the lean principles help you to be able to see that waste and eliminate that waste from your existing business. And that's the stuff that we can control. I'm just thinking the principles here uh, will be applied to a lot of industries all very much needing what your consultancy. How are we going to spread you a lot more thinly, nicely across the whole economy to fix it for us? Um, yeah, that's a good question. We'll <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, you need to be in the business council with, um, <laughs> no, it's wonderful, absolutely. And I, and I say that um, not lightheartedly because if you can get your hands on uh, this one here I got from Whitkills, um, you can source it as the Lean Dairy Farm. Um, I highly recommend it's a very good read uh, from, for business systems and procedures, as um, Jana was just saying, across all industries as well. So as we were just saying there, uh, Matt, you know, this, this, this lockdown, how do we harness the great ideas that people have had in lockdown and take this forward as we move up through the alert system um, to be, what, what are some of the areas that you believe uh, are going to be really crucial in the rebuild of, uh, as Paul Henry says, our paradise? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. We've, we've um, you know, reached out to our, our smart farm network, as we call it, the Rural Innovation Lab, um, and there's we're going to work on the New Zealand broadband. Um, no, and they're going to come back. Okay. Sorry, continue Sorry your that. smart farm network. Yeah, so the smart farm network, we've engaged with some farmers um, and growers across that. And there's actually quite a pivot even from a year ago when we went out and we, we got some feedback from a number of um, digital boot camps and, and meetings on what were the key themes or, that uh, farmers and growers were focusing on. So there's a real, real pivot now. Um, particularly around digital connectivity, um, waste, waste and optimization, um, and digital opportunities, um, online stock trading, market access, traceability, uh, and biosecurity. So, really, I think you know, under the pressure of um, potential, um, or, or there will be recession, but. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a quite a refocus from what there was. Some of those longer run themes will continue, you know, around the environment and so forth. But um, definitely, they're the ones that are coming out um, strongly to us. And um, yeah, I guess how, how do we deal with that? How do we and also how do we harness the this period of creativity because it does make us, you know, get back to those fundamentals, focus on them. Uh, well, there's a couple of things you can do. We've um, we're going to have a, a series of digital boot camps, which is. Um, um, for farmers and growers, uh, we also have some some um, speakers there to really frame up um, our discussions and, and, and look really um, at the heart of issues. Uh, our first one will be in May. We've also got um, so that's that's for our smart farmer network. We're also launching three uh, smart farms in the region across uh, dairy, sheep, and beef, and, and horticulture. So they're going to be real test places for. Um, innovators to come and um, test, trial, and work with with farmers on their particular ideas. 
So we've got, yeah, we've actually got a, um, a pretty exciting uh, couple of months ahead of us, despite the, the or in spite of the, the lockdown. Um, and we're hoping to harness all that creativity and ideas that are out there um, and really give it a focal point to, to help move it forward. Thank you so much on behalf of uh, New Zealand and everyone uh, listening at, and watching at home for coming home to New Zealand. <laughs> and, be, and, and, and of course I'm um, being able to be a very big part of what I know you will be uh, New Zealand's rural sectors uh, innovation coming to life and of course our businesses being able to be in a position to to um, persist and survive and get through and thrive so thank you so much that's Matt and Yana Hocken uh, out of the Manawatu that's all we've got time for tonight, sadly. Now, if you've missed any of the previous shows, you can, of course, get them uh, in your ears on podcast first thing in the morning on demand in Sarah's country. Or if you want to head along to the Farmers Weekly YouTube channel, you can go back and listen to, oh, sorry, watch any of the individual uh, videos of the interviews on YouTube as well. Of course, I want your suggestions. I, I Actually, now I'm daily getting emails of suggestions for guests. It could be yourself. It could also be, of course, people that you want to hear from uh, in the industry. Sarah at sarahperium.com or drop into the slip into the DMs anywhere across the social media. Now, go. I want to say to you tonight, uh, the word pivot has happened to become a huge part of our vocabulary uh, in the last month. With pivoting, the thing that is central to your ability to pivot is a thing that's anchored solely into the ground and it's called your purpose. If you don't know that, go and find it first and then you'll know how to pivot. Good night, go well, and if you think you're crazy, as the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland says, I'm not crazy, my reality is just different to yours. This is Sarah's Country.